In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, it is Mailbag Monday, but it is on a Thursday. On Monday, I did a live episode at the NTX Combine. I've been working the Combine the last three days. Today will make day four, and I've been extremely busy, extremely busy as the director of scouting, dealing with the agents and the players and the logistics and creating all the content. It's been crazy, so... That's why Mailbag Monday is on a Thursday, but we haven't done Mailbag Monday in a while. So I'm looking forward to reading and answering the questions that have been appearing in my inbox. So find out some of the crazy questions that I've been receiving. Stay tuned. Big, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for... NBA Big Board, had to think about that, and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies, and I just served as the director of scouting for the NTX Combine, which is a combine for draft eligible seniors. It's been a fun process of putting these teams together, these groups together, dealing with the agents, watching the film on the guys. I really, I really enjoyed it. So it's been crazy, though, the last two weeks. I'm a little bit behind on my own personal draft content. So next week, be prepared for me to flood your inbox if you are an NBA Big Board subscriber with content. And then I'll be off to the NBA Combine in, I guess, about two weeks, a little less than two weeks. Then maybe next week I may um, have some more content from some, some pretty highly rated prospects coming up soon. So, all right, let's get right into it. This is Mailbag Thursday. All right, so the first question is, I just started paying attention to the draft a few weeks ago. I'm a Hornets fan, and who should we take at number four if we do not move up? Right now, a lot of people are sliding. If you go best player available, then I'll be Amon Thompson at number four. I'm not a really big fan of the fit, but I understand the concept behind best player available. The fit would be interesting. It would either be like this dynamic backcourt of LaMelo Ball and Amon Thompson, two guys with size, exceptional passers. Amon Thompson is an incredible, incredible athlete, I think. I mean, as soon as he enters the NBA, he'll be one of the top 10 best athletes in the NBA. So it could work out. I I do think that Amon is best with the ball in his hands. And I just wonder how effective he'll be in a role where he's splitting ball handling duties with a mellow ball. But on the other hand, you can say that he split ball handling duties a little bit with his brother, Asur, and he's played well with him. But, I mean, it's it's a huge, huge, huge jump from overtime elite to the NBA. Amon Thompson is, like I said, best player available. They could opt to go with maybe somebody like Cam Whitmore, even though I think Cam Whitmore is a little bit redundant to – Miles Bridges, um, but then you you never know what, what they're going to do with Miles Bridges. Unfortunately for for Miles, he well, I mean, unfortunately he put himself in this in this predicament. But fortunately for the Hornets, if they do bring him back, they'll be able to get him back at what I imagine is a crazy reduced role. I mean, he was a guy that people were talking about getting a max contract, and he has like twenty points, eight rebounds in his last season. So they may be able to get him for a 50% off <laughs> discount than, than um, what they're expecting to pay. But I think there is some redundancy there. Jairus Walker, some may feel that's a reach. He could be someone that, that Charlotte could target. They have P.J. Washington, who is a free agent. So Walker could be a replacement there. But if they go best player available, I think they're going to go with Amon Thompson. All right, the second question is... <laughs> This is a question that it's like you hear every day or you read under every comment involving Victor Wimbayama. But the question is, do you think Wimbayama's body will hold up? He's really skinny. Is he the new Chet? All right, number one, Chet had a foot injury that he suffered in a game that they ended up canceling because I guess there was condensation on the floor. Not To my knowledge... Chet didn't have an injury history prior to that injury. And in my personal opinion, I think 
he could have played this season. The Thunder were being really, really cautious. So, assuming that Wimbenyama is the new Chet and basically hinting at Chet being injury prone, I just think that is, I just think that is honestly really ridiculous. Now, Victor has had some some bouts with injuries, some minor injuries. I think it's like a finger. I think there's like a muscle injury last year. But this year, he's been healthy. This year, he's been healthy, and he's playing in the French League. He even played in the FIBA qualifiers during the season. There's one particular play, and I wish I could, like, show it. There's one play where he slipped on a sticker and had a nasty fall. Like, <laughs> it looked like he tore every ligament in his knee, or at least was going to. And he bounced right back up. And I guess that is kind of like a, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess it just shows how flexible he is and how much him and his training staff and his agency have been working on his flexibility. And I I spoke to his agent about it and actually showed him the video. And he was, and I said, were you concerned? Did you see like everything flash in front of your eyes when he fell? And he said, no, I wasn't worried. So I wasn't worried. The kid is really flexible. So with all that being said, I don't think that it's it's going to be an issue for Wimbenyama's body to hold up. He's 19 years old. He's going to progressively get stronger. I know that they're not on a fast track to allow him to put on a bunch of weight and, and bulk up faster than he needs to. So I think he's going to be fine. I, I really think he's going to be fine. I just think that... It is fair in the sense that there is a history of guys that are over seven foot having injuries, but I also think it's unfair to just kind of throw him into that to that box just because, you know, past history. And then also just comparing him to Chet because Chet had a foot injury. I just think that's honestly ridiculous. All right. Who should the Lakers take at number 17? At number 17, I mean, if I'm the Lakers, I'm always going to lean towards shooting. As long as you have LeBron James and Anthony Davis, I mean, shooting is always going to be something that could make that team better. If Jordan Hawkins is available in that range, he would be someone that I would that I would really consider. I think he would be able to come in and and, and make impact. Um, It also just depends on free agency. Is Russell coming back? Is Austin Reeves coming back? They may want some size at center. I think Derek Lively or Noah Clowney could also be in play. They're both represented by Clutch and should be available in that range. So it just depends. It's going to depend on how the season ends. I mean, they're up 1-0 right now. If there's some major needs that that get exposed in the playoffs and, and like I said, their backcourt leaves, then maybe they'll lean towards some backcourt help. Jalen Hood Shafino is the guy that I like. I don't know if he's able to come in and play right away off the ball um, because LeBron is still going to have the ball in his hands more. But it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. But if I were a betting man, I think if Lively or Clowney is available, then I think that's the direction that they're leaning just because of the clutch ties. But if, like I said, if Jordan Hawkins is available, that would be that would be who I would go with. All right, next question is, Nearly every mock has Dallas taking Taylor Hendricks. Can he help the Mavs win now? And that's a really, really, really good question. On one hand, I think the Mavs are in this really weird predicament simply because Luka's young. I think Luka's, what, 23, 24? And there's this win now pressure despite having a 22 or, I'm sorry, 23 or 24-year-old superstar. In most cases... A guy like Hendricks would fit the timeline of the team star if he's 23 or 24 years old. But there's like this win now mode. I wonder if the Mavs did draft him at number 10. Like what would his role be? I mean, we saw Jaden Hardy. Now, Jaden Hardy was, you know, a second round pick. So you don't usually come into to training camp with with any advantages as, as a second round pick. But Jason Kidd was reluctant to play him, despite the fact that when when um, Hardy was in the G League, he was putting up like 28 points a game, like 50, 40, 90 shooting, something crazy like that. So my, my question would be, 
how how willing would would Jason Kidd be to allow Hendrix to learn on the fly when there are some people that are already calling for his job and there's this pressure to win now? So I think it's going to be an interesting situation. I, I can't see if, if Maxi Cleaver's back. I can't see Kidd playing Hendrix over Maxi because he really likes Maxi and, and deservedly so. So I don't know. I mean, the Mavs could end up trading the pick for for – that that would be my guess that they would possibly look at trading the pick, the Kyrie situation and whether he returns or not, even though on the outside looking in, it looks favorable could play a role in who the Mavs select. So can he help the Mavs win now? I mean, I, I imagine the Mavs are going to be better next year than they were this year. And I think that he could have a, a role. I just don't think it would be like a large role because I think Jason Kidd will lean towards veterans. All right, when we return, I'll answer a few more questions. But today, speaking of winning, we're going to talk about winning a championship. But when you want to win a championship, of course, you need to make sure every player is a perfect fit. But it is the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With the eBay Guarantee Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check. And, to, and you will find out if the part will fit or you will get your money back because like in sports, confidence is the name of the game. And when you shop on eBay Motors, you can have confidence that you're going to get the right part. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. So after all, it is easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. So get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. And the eBay guarantee fit. It is only available to U.S. customers. So I apologize to my Canadian brothers out there. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Thank you for making the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. Every day or tomorrow on the show, it will be one of my co-hosts, Leif Tulene or Richard Stamen. And all three of us will be at the NBA Combine in two weeks, looking forward to that. We're going to give you some live shows there, which means I got to pack my equipment, my my cameras and stuff. All right. Next question. What are your thoughts on Marcus Sasser? What's his NBA role? He doesn't seem like a point guard, and he is too small to be a two. And I really like Marcus Sasser. I, I thought that he was one of the better returning players in college basketball this year. Got off to like an extremely slow start, but finished off strong. His season didn't end the way they expected. I know Houston was looking to play in the Final Four in Houston, but Sasser ended up finishing at a respectable rate from three. I I don't think he is a natural point, and I understand the theory that he's too small to be a two, but I see him as someone that can come off the bench and be a spark plug and be a complimentary guy to a dominant ball handler ball handler so a team that i think fits and i'm not saying that the lakers should take him at 17 but a team that i think fits for his style of play would be like the lakers with lebron if lebron is your primary and you need a someone that can defend the points but just knock down open shots i think sass would be good there i think he could play like a similar role to what Maxi is playing. Now, he's not Tyrese Maxi. Don't get me wrong. He doesn't have the burst. But I think in some cases, he could share a backcourt with a guy like Harden, where Harden can guard the twos. He can guard the ones. Harden would be the primary, and he could knock down open shots and provide some instant offense there. Dallas, if Dallas had a pick in that range... I think he could play alongside Luka. I, I think there is a role for him in the NBA. I see him more so as like a, a six-man, the guy that just brings instant offense off the bench. But you know he played for University of Houston. So when you play for University of Houston, you know he's tough and he has a, a competitive fire because you can't play for Kevin Sampson and not have not have that dog in you. So um, I think that is going to be his role. His role is going to be a top Seven eight rotation player that brings instant offense. All right, next question is the Bucks have the last pick in the draft. Do you think there's anyone <laughs> that can help? 
Yeah, if you get someone that can come in and contribute and help at pick 60 or, or 58, I know there's two teams that don't have picks this year, then that is like a super, super win. I mean, you got guys that are first-round picks that really don't come in and contribute and help. So at 58, finding someone that can come in and contribute would, would be pretty difficult. It would be very, very difficult unless – there's like an unfortunate circumstance where there is a bunch of injuries and guys are, are forced to come in and play. To be honest, just giving you an honest answer, no. I think whoever the Bucks draft, whether it's somebody that they're stashing like they did last year with Hugo Besson, I just think whoever they draft with the last pick is going to spend a lot of time with the Wisconsin Herd. And it will be an up, 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 uphill battle because Milwaukee is looking to get back to the finals next year. I mean, I'm still in shock in the sense that the Milwaukee Bucks are out of the playoffs right now. The Milwaukee Bucks lost in the first round. But, yeah, again, to answer your question, no, I don't think that there's anyone that can come in and contribute and help right away. Unless it is a rare situation to where, I mean, I know Austin Reeves didn't get drafted and it was like a strategic plan by his agents. Unless there is a situation where there are, there's a guy that his agent strategically thinks, all right, if he lands it with the Bucks, he can come in and help. And he tells teams that are drafting ahead, we don't want a two way, we want a guaranteed deal. And then that forces the teams to be like, okay, we're going to take somebody that we think is going to take a two way. And then, boom, takes a two way with the Bucks finds uh i don't know <laughs> in in a preseason training camp it's just i think it would have to be really strategic and planned out but we'll see all right thoughts on kobe brown do you think he can stick in the nba where is he project where he's projected to go it doesn't seem like scouts think he'll last late second round guys seem to flame out I actually like kobe brown um th- there are some concerns i did talk to some scouts that were concerned that he had like one really, really NBA prospect caliber year at Missouri. There's some that think he's a little bit older and they may lean towards somebody that's younger that they think has an upside. But there are times when I watch Kobe Brown, I'm like, <laughs> you got to think I'm crazy. There was one game where I watched him and I was like, this dude looked like Mashburn, Jamal Mashburn. Totally different players. Jamal was a beast. But when I say he looked like Mashburn, I was talking about the size, like the, the the rare blend of like size, strength, fluidity, coordination, finesse. And this particular game, I mean, he was just draining jumper after jumper. And then when they put someone smaller on him, he made just a few nimble plays that showed his footwork. And he's a good passer. I didn't realize it, but he played point guard in high school. And I, th- I think they told me they played. he played for his dad in high school. So he does have some skills. I've heard somebody sent me a message and compared him to P.J. Tucker, which is a weird comparison. Maybe in, like, body type in a sense. But, I mean, obviously P.J. is more chiseled and, and cut than, than Kobe Brown, but someone said they think he can play a similar role where he just kind of stands in the corner. But you're leaving off that P.J. Brown is a really, really good physical defender. And the fact that he's going to be 38 or 38 years old and he's still playing big minutes on a team with deep playoff run, you know, uh, expectations, finals, it's totally different. I, You know, it's just rare to compare somebody to somebody that's playing at 38 so he'd have to obviously kind of change his mentality to be a P.J. Tucker type defender. Skill wise, I I probably say he's probably a little bit more skilled than than P.J. But it's all about role and accepting a role. But Kobe Brown is is good. I like him. I like the passing. I like the shooting. I I do think that he is going to be a second round pick. I actually see him as someone that's going to look really good in summer league, but I think it's just going to be an, an uphill battle from there. I had one team official tell me, I like him. I like his game. I like everything about him. But his exact words were, as soon as our coach sees him, I know our coach 
our coach is going to be turned off by the visuals, by his body type and how he looks. So it's going to take some convincing there to get our coach to be on board with him. That's just coming from a scout that I have spoke with about Kobe Brown. And this was this was during the NCAA tournament. All right. When we return, I have a few more questions that I want to wrap up. And let's talk about better help because this episode is sponsored by better help give online therapy a try at betterhelp.com slash locked on nba and get on your way to being your best self it is so easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you and never take a moment to think about what you need for yourself i know any parent can relate and I'm new to the game as a parent. I'm very, 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 very new to the game as a parent. My son is only nine months old. But there are times where you just kind of get caught up in doing everything that you need to do, making sure the baby's straight, making sure the family is straight, and you don't take enough time for yourself. But when we spend all our time giving, it can leave us feeling stretched thin and burned out. And therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind so if you're thinking about starting therapy give better help a try it is entirely online it is designed to be convenient flexible and suited to your schedule just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched up with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge find more balance with better help visit betterhelp.com slash locked on mba to get 10 percent off your first month that is better h-e-l-p.com slash locked on nba all right, last few questions. All right, how do you have, oh, this is a personal question. How do you have access to so many players and agents? Um, it's, it's a combination of things. Number one, I put out a lot of content. I put out a lot, a lot of content over the years. So agents like to find out where their players is, is ranked agents like to find out you know just what draft twitter or what draft analysts are saying about about their clients so sometimes if you are putting out good content about their client then um it opens a door for communication and to build a relationship number two when i took over for chad that gave me an even like stronger credibility with with different agencies so that helped out a lot and then also just um i guess people feel like i'm trustworthy and i have their clients best interest in mind i'm not really out bashing clients or 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 whatever because you, you just never know i mean like i can i mean there are guys that i will brutally honestly share my opinion on but i'm never like really really bashing guys and maybe i've been highly critical of a player here and there but it's just coming from just my personal assessment and you just never know because if i'm talking bad about player a in 2023 in 2024 this agency could have a player that i really like and maybe i want access to i think my philosophy is a little bit different i'm obviously a podcaster and a journalist but i don't know if i consider myself to be a a journalist and I'm not like in a rush to like break news I'm not in a rush to to get a story out there faster than everyone else I'm just being me in a sense so I said all that to say this um I think some people think I'm trustworthy they know like if I'm filming their client in a gym I'm not gonna put out any content that's gonna make their guy look bad um and then i guess you know they see me around like there there are a lot of guys that want to be in this in this space but they're they're not around so at least for me a lot of times you can put a face with a name which you know costs money it's a lot of betting on myself a lot of betting on myself i'm totally independent so if i'm at a game i'm spending my own money i just bought a flight to chicago for the combine i mean nobody's paying for me to go there so spending my money i mean i I bought a ticket with points (laughs) so 
just putting her name with a face, I think that helps out a lot. I remember one one particular high ranking NBA person told me, he's like, You are in the gym. And he's like, There's a lot of guys that have these platforms. I never see them. They're never in the gym. So I think that helps out a lot. So just because guys have seen me, whether it's at NBA games, whether it's at different tournaments, put a name with a face, seen my work, they may like my work, and it just has given me the access. And a lot of the top prospects in this class, I've been invited to come to their workouts and so on. So that's a long answer, but that is how I've been able to get access. And there's some guys, just like I live in Dallas, Dallas may have seven or eight guys that are going to be drafted in this year's draft some guys i've been filming since they were like third or fourth grade if they're in dallas then i probably know who their trainer is i've probably been around them in gyms before so that makes it pretty easy all right last two questions tankathon doesn't have grant nelson in their top 60 why isn't he a first rounder am i missing something honestly you know people ask me this question all the time why isn't this guy here? I think this guy should be here. Why, why, why? And I tell people this. Trust your opinion. NBA teams are going to be wrong. I'm going to be wrong. Everybody's going to be wrong. So if you think that a guy is a first rounder, then stand by it. Don't necessarily <laughs> think that if I tell you he's not, then then that should change how you feel. But if you think he's a first rounder, then, you know, put him as a first rounder. I think that Grant is very intriguing. I think he's very, very intriguing. I know I spoke with someone once and he said, we don't have anybody on our roster at that size that can handle and finish at the rim like he does. So um, why isn't he a first rounder? I think the lack of competition is a little bit concerning. I know that they played some bigger schools. I know they played Kansas and Arkansas. I don't think he had like really big numbers there. So I do think there is a concern about how his athleticism translates when he's going against guys that are just as athletic, just as athletic. I don't know why that was so tough to say. The shooting is a concern. He's not much of a floor spacer at this point. He does have skills. I think it's going to be very interesting to see what, what happens with him over the next over the next few months. If he goes into a workout and he's showing his athleticism and he's knocking down jump shots and consistently knocking down threes, then he could be a big, big riser. Or if he goes to the combine and he plays in five on five and he doesn't look great, looks a little lost, then he could end up, you know, in a situation where maybe he goes back to school. I don't I don't know if he's put his name in a portal. I don't know. if I, I don't know. Like the portal deadline. I could imagine. A lot of the bigger blue blood schools from the power five schools are hoping that he doesn't succeed at the combine as crazy as that sounds and hoping that he enters the portal because I think he would be like the hottest, the hot, I want to say free agent, but the hottest uh, transfer portal and name in the transfer portal if, if that is an option. So to be honest with you, I don't know. I mean, Grant is a wild card and um yeah, the next few months are going to really be interesting to see how, how how it works out for him. He is with, I want to call it BDA, but WME, Power Agency, which has a just a absolutely tremendous class. So he does have a, a strong agency behind him that can really do some good work for him. Um, but I could see him getting drafted, and I could also see a situation where he's not drafted. All right, last question. The Pacers have three first-round picks. Do you think they'll keep them? I honestly can't see a situation where the Indiana Pacers keep three first-round picks. I imagine there's going to be some trades on draft night. I think the Pacers are going to be one of the busier teams on draft night. I think they're in a situation where they have some veterans, but they're also a young team. I don't know what they're going to do with Buddy Hill. Are they going to try to move Hill so they can open up minutes for Matherin? Then you add in their, you know, their lottery pick. And I don't know. I just can't imagine them keeping all three picks because I don't think they're all, all, all the way in on a rebuild just because they, I mean, they were a playoff team at least up until January. So I think they may make a run for the playoffs. So I think they'll try to consolidate some picks. But then again, they could trade Buddy Hill and go all in. I, I have no idea. So 
we will see but well, that wraps up this episode of mailback monday on a thursday big big shout out to each and every person that has made the locked on nba big board podcast your first listen of the day and in tomorrow's episode it'll be either leaf Tulane or richard stamen we are going we are going to bring you the best draft talk out and i am out